can he tell me that being extremely honest is wrong, extremely just is wrong, extremely peaceful is wrong? We have to be an extremist, but in the right direction. So when someone says I'm extremist, I have to be an extremist Muslim. Only if I'm an extremist Muslim can I be a good Muslim. Otherwise, I can't. I know these terminologies have been manipulated. The definitions keep on changing. But we have to turn the tables over. We can't partly follow the Quran. We have to extremely and completely follow the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208, Allah says, Utkhlu fi silmi ka'affa, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Today, Muslims, they're labeled as terrorists. The basic and simple definition of terrorist is the person who causes terror. For example, if a criminal sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the criminal, the policeman is a terrorist. <laughs> In this context, I say that every Muslim should be a terrorist. Whenever any criminal sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any robber sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Whenever any anti-social element sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. That's what the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 60, that cause terror in the hearts of the anti-social elements. Those people who are killing wrong people, who are against humanity, Quran says, cause terror in their hearts. I know that commonly the word terrorist means terrorizing innocent human beings. In this context, no Muslim should ever terrorize any innocent human being. It is prohibited in Islam. <laughs> we know that many a times, two different labels are given for the same person, for the same individual, for the same activity, more than 60 years back, when India was being ruled by the British government. There were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country. These Indians who were fighting for the freedom of the country by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government, that they had a right to rule over India, then you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians, that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you have to call them as patriots, as freedom fighters. These same very Britishers, they call Bhagat Singh, Chandrasekhar Azad, Subhash Chandra Bose as terrorists. Do we agree? Not at all. Just because the Britishers say, just because the Americans say, we don't have to believe, we have to fight for justice. They were patriots, they were freedom fighters. Therefore, before you give a label to any individual, you have to try and find out for what reason is he striving. We have several such examples in world history. Time does not permit us to give all the details. I'll just give one more example of the American Revolution, which took place in the 19th century. And we know in 1875, during the American Revolution, there were many Americans who were fighting for the freedom. The British were ruling America. And these people who fought for the freedom by the British government, they were called as terrorists. And number one in the forefront was Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. We know that these people by the British government, they were called as terrorists, number one. George Washington was called terrorist number one. Later on, he becomes the president of USA. And he happens to be the same terrorist number one he becomes the president of USA and happens to be the godfather of all the presidents to come, including George Bush. <laughs> Imagine the same people who the British has called as terrorists. Now they're allies. They are the best friends. The time keeps on changing, depending upon historical background, depending upon geographical background. What we come to know, in short, whoever is in power, whatever label he gives, the label gets stuck. Whoever is in power. Today, America is supposed to be in power. They have the media with them. So who they call a terrorist, the label gets stuck. It gets stuck. I had gone to Australia in December 2001, just a couple of months after 9-11. And one of my first talks was in the city of Perth. I gave a talk on jihad and terrorism and Islamic perspective. The first question that was asked to me was by the American Consul General of Perth. And the first question he asked me, the Dr. Naik, do you consider Osama bin Laden to be a terrorist? And I told him, as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, I don't know. I haven't met him. I haven't interrogated him. He is neither my friend, neither is my enemy. I cannot give the answer based on the news reports of BBC and CNN. 
If you want the answer based on BBC and CNN, you have no option but to say he's a terrorist. But the Quran says in Surah Jurat, chapter number 49, verse number 6, that whenever you get information, check it up before you pass it on to the second person. So therefore, as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, I cannot say whether he's a terrorist or not. He's neither my friend, neither my enemy. I have integrated him. But what I can say very well, that we have got established proof very well from the same media controlled by them, from CNN, from BBC. We know that thousands of innocent Afghans have been killed in Afghanistan. Thousands of Iraqis have been killed in Iraq. Even if we agree, 9-11, they say, was done by Osama bin Laden. No proof, hypothetical. When the Afghanistan government wants proof, George Bush gives it to Tony Blair. He gives it to Musharraf. <laughs> and normally, even if we agree, for sake of argument, Osama bin Laden did it, for sake of argument. But does it justify in killing thousands of innocent people? Normally, on international level, there's extradition policy that whenever any person who's a culprit in a country goes to another country, you can get him back. For example, India and UK have extradition policy. A few years back, one of the music director, Nadeem, according to Indian government, he was involved in murder. He goes and sits in UK. The Indian government has extradition policy with UK, but when they wanted him back, they said, prove it that he's a culprit. Many people from India went there. Our police force went there. They could not prove. They even had to pay for the lawyer charges of that Nadeem. <laughs> we know that in the Bhopal gas tragedy, we know that thousands of innocent Indians were killed. The person of Union Carbide goes to America and sits there. Imagine the Indian government attacking America, give the person back. Is it right? Why don't they do it? It is proved. Union Carbide, thousands of innocent human beings killed, injured, wounded, damaged for life, families ruined, ran away. We have extradition policy, nothing happens. So Afghanistan and USA don't have extradition policy yet. Even if you agree, for sake of argument, Osama bin Laden did it, it is not justified killing of innocent human beings. More than three to 5,000 Afghans were killed. Then, after a couple of years, goes to Iraq, weapons of mass destruction. And they go there, after the attack, they don't find anything. Yet, they're controlling Iraq. What is the cause? What is the reason? And people in Iraq are more troubled. They were troubled with Saddam Hussein. You're not a good Muslim. You're not a practicing Muslim. I'm not in favor of Saddam Hussein. But the trouble they're facing after America has come to Iraq is multiple times more. More people are being robbed. More people are being raped. The main purpose is what? Is oil. oil. It's an open secret. So I told the American consul general that time that according to me, number one terrorist in the world is George Bush. <laughs> and I'm a person who keeps on speaking very often. I had gone to Australia just a couple of months after 9-11. It comes as headlines in the newspaper at that time, December 2001. Dr. Zakir Naik calls himself a fundamentalist and says George Bush is terrorist number one. <laughs> I did not know of any speaker on a public level I don't know, maybe, maybe, who has condemned George Bush as terrorist number one. Today, it is very common. I can name a hundred top personalities, and we know that the Honorable Justice Husband, I didn't know that even he considered, rightly, he's an honest judge, and I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know when is the first time he said, I don't want to compete with him, he's more senior to me. I don't know when is the first time he said that. But now when we read records, we come to know that the president of Venezuela, Hago Chavez, he said that the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. The president-elect of Bovillia, Evo Morales, he said that George Bush is a terrorist. The famous singer and activist of America, Harry Belfont, he said the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. An MP in UK, an MP in UK by the name of George Galloway, he said the biggest terrorist in the world is George Bush. And he said that the blood that is there on the hands of George Bush and Tony Blair is much more than the bombers who have done bombing in London. And when you have asked, he said, it will be justified 
George Galloway, who's MP in UK, he says, it will be justified that if a suicide bomber goes and attacks and kills Tony Blair without injuring any other innocent human being, that suicide bomber will be justified. Who said that? George Galloway. <laughs> we have Jyoti Basu a few months back. He said, when George Bush came to India, that number one terrorist is George Bush. <laughs> Everyone says that, but the Indian government wants to invite him. For what? So that we learn the art of terrorism? <laughs> Recently, a couple of days back, it was a news article in the newspapers that the Nobel Prize winner, Nobel Prize winner Betty Williams, she said that she would love to kill George Bush. <laughs> she would love to kill George Bush, which I defer. <laughs>